Hello everyone, this is Pulkit from The Spiritual Bee and in this video I would like to address questions that have arisen in some of your minds after watching my last two videos on the topic of ghosts. Now before I delve into your questions, I would like to explain my aim in touching upon this topic of ghosts. I had two aims in mind. The first was to draw your attention to the fact that even though many western scientists these days assume that life ends with the death of the physical body, the phenomena of ghosts stands in sharp contrast to this scientific claim and for an ordinary person on the street who possesses no yogic powers, this phenomena of ghosts simply serves to validate the great Vedantic truth that life in fact does continue after the dissolution of the physical body. Now granted that a vast majority of ghostly sightings can certainly be dismissed as hallucinations of the brain, still we cannot extend this label to all. In particular, in India, there have been many credible instances recorded in the lives of extremely rational and scientific-minded Vedantic gurus such as Swami Vivekanan, Swami Brahmanan and Swami Abhedanan, all three of whom were direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Aurobindo and the mother, Pandit Sri Ram Sharma Acharya and many other yogis whose interactions with the departed and whose accounts of the afterlife cannot be easily dismissed as mere mental hallucinations. Having said all this, I do not want you to get the impression that I am encouraging you to explore the paranormal or to chase ghosts or to interact with them through mediumship or seances. All these are terrible ideas and certainly not the goal of a spiritually oriented person such as a Vedantin. Our goal is self-realization and self-realization alone. In fact, Swami Abhedanan has strictly cautioned that interacting with ghosts often results in a person developing various types of psychological illnesses and even going insane. My second aim, and this is the more important one, was to highlight a critical message of the Rishis of Vedanta and that is that life must be lived in such a way so that death for us becomes an easy transition and not a torturous or trapped exit. Now the only way this can happen, as we have seen in the previous video, is if life is lived bravely and courageously with a strong emphasis on spiritual evolution, meaning evolving to a higher consciousness, rather than an all-consuming focus on maximizing material gains and indulging in reckless sense enjoyments. So these were my two aims and with these out of the way, let me now move on to your questions. Question number one. I thought ghosts did not exist but after watching your videos now I'm really scared of ghosts. There is actually no rational reason why we must be frightened of ghosts. Ghosts are just ordinary people who have died. They don't possess any supernatural powers. They are themselves lost and confused, unable to extricate themselves from their tragic earthbound conditions. So what harm can they do to us? Just think about it. If ghosts actually had the power to do physical harm, then the ghost of every murdered person would be able to avenge his or her killers. No murderer, serial killer or terrorist would ever need to be prosecuted or sent to jail. The ghost of the victim would only need to push the murderer off a cliff or cause some other accident to happen and get immediate justice. But we know that this is most certainly not the case. All our fears of ghosts actually stem from our wild imaginations. They have their basis either in our deep-rooted fear of the unknown or in the imaginative portrayals that we see in horror films. This point has been well explained by Swami Vivekanan long ago when he said, Terror of the supernatural is always a sign of imagination. On that day when you really meet what we call a ghost, you will know no fear. Now remember that Swami Vivekanan here is speaking from personal experience, having encountered a few ghosts in his life as I've documented on the Spiritual Bee website. So the next time you feel fearful, the best thing to do is to imagine the opposite state of bravery and courage. Think of the great Rani Lakshmi Bai or the great Rana Pratap and reflect how these people would react if they ever saw a ghost. Would they run away in fear? Absolutely not. They would pull out their swords and cut the ghost into two. Then why must we be so weak and tremble in our imaginations? We too must become brave and fearless just like them. This quality of fearlessness is most critical if we are to progress on the spiritual path towards expanding our consciousness. Without attaining to fearlessness, God-realization or Samadhi is absolutely impossible. In fact, one of the defining marks of a true yogi is that he or she is completely fearless. It is for this reason that Swami Vivekanan has said, 
If there is one word that is coming out like a bomb from the Upanishads, it is the word abhi meaning fearless. Fear is the cause of all degradation and sin. It is fear that brings misery, fear that brings death, fear that breeds evil. And what is the cause of this fear? Ignorance of our own nature. Each of us are the substance of God himself. Nay, according to Advaita, we are God himself though we have forgotten our own nature in thinking of ourselves as little men. If our souls are one with God himself, then why must we fear some ghost? Let us arise, let us awake as Swami Vivekanand has said and let us become brave, bold and courageous. Question number 2. In the video you mentioned that ghosts can possess people. Can a ghost possess me? Ok, so this question is referring to the previous video. Now before we start getting unnecessarily paranoid about ghosts possessing us, let us remember two important things. The first is that out of all the individuals who die daily on this planet, very few of them actually get trapped as ghosts after death. Most people after death can and eventually do move on. This fact has been explained by Sri Ram Sharma Achar in his book Life Beyond Physical Death. Now if ghosts are few in number, then possessions by ghosts are by default fewer still. The second point to remember is that in order for any outside entity such as a ghost to possess us, by which I mean that we start obeying their thoughts, desires and ideas instead of our own, we must be of a very weak mental constitution. Ghosts as we have seen in the previous video are a lost, confused lot who harbour many unfulfilled desires. So for us to obey such a ghost's mental suggestions, we too must either be hopelessly lost and confused, possessing a very weak willpower with little ability to discriminate right from wrong, or be an unthinking slave of our baser desires such as those for sex, alcohol or drugs. This fact has been further detailed by Sriram Sharma Achar who was a God-realized guru in his book that I just mentioned where he explains, Ghosts do not cross our path unnecessarily but we provide them with an opportunity to do so because of our own mental weaknesses. Ghosts find it easy to possess people who suffer from weakness of will, excessive fear, a superstitious mindset and who are slaves to many vices. The desires of ghosts are of a very low order and so they try to find people having similar infatuations in order to use them as mediums to satisfy their own cravings. For this purpose, ghosts wander around brothels, gambling and drinking dens and other socially ostracized places. Visitors to such places secretly and unknowingly become possessed by such spirits temporarily. Though the visitor remains unaware, they know that a visit to such places of addiction excites their desires extraordinarily. Now if we are a person who is not mired in any such vices, if we are spiritually strong, if we possess strong willpower and are above all rational and not prone to superstitions, then Sri Ram Sharma Acharya tells us that these poor ghosts cannot do us any harm. This is because a strong mind acts like a fortress, like an impenetrable barrier which the weak and powerless ghosts can never breach with their foolish suggestions. Now besides being mentally weak, there is one other situation in which ghosts can possess people and that is when someone deliberately allows them to take control of their mind and body as is done by some spirit mediums in the West. This kind of mediumship has never been in vogue in India because the Vedantic Rishis have always forbidden it. Their rationale for forbidding it has been twofold as Swami Abhedanand has explained in his book. Firstly, many mediums end up suffering from horrible mental diseases. Secondly, interacting with ghosts is largely a pointless endeavor because the ghosts themselves are a disoriented and ignorant lot and so any hope that they can offer us credible information about the afterlife or about God or about heaven and hell or even reveal the grand purpose of life is like placing our faith in a drunken person's ability to guide us back home. Question number 3. There is a graveyard close to my home. Is the energy of my home affected by it? Here is a practical question from which we can derive some great life lessons. See sometimes life puts us in situations from which we have no escape except to evolve to a higher consciousness. And the way we do this is by weeding out weaknesses that abound in our inner nature. Having a house close to a graveyard is one such situation. Now if you are like most people, changing house is not always an option especially in today's environment of skyrocketing real estate prices. So in this situation, we are left with no choice except to overcome not just our fear of ghosts but also to clear our mind of some irrational, unfounded and superstitious ideas that invariably crop up. 
The fear part we have already discussed, so let me focus on the superstitious part as this tendency exists within all of us in varying degrees. Many times we mistakenly ascribe great power to things which are inherently powerless. Thinking that some outside entity can affect our house's energy or our own happiness or affect our fate or destiny are some common superstitions that nag us from within. But as we have seen in the answer to question 1, the rishis of the Upanishads have taught us that our souls are one with God himself. And so all power of the universe lies in our very soul. Then why must the energy of a house be affected by anything other than our own energy? Is our own energy, by which I mean our mental state, so weak that some entity outside can overpower it so easily? When we think in this irrational and superstitious manner, what we are doing is that we are unknowingly transferring the great power that lies in our own hands to some random phenomena outside. And what this kind of thinking results in is that in the long run we become unnecessarily fearful and distrustful of our own capabilities. We hurt our own self-confidence and ultimately we reverse the progress of our own spiritual evolution because we falsely start believing that we are weak and helpless when in fact we are powerful divine beings. All power, as Swami Vivekananda has said, lies within us, only waiting to be manifest. So the answer to this question is that no one can affect our home's energy except our own self. If we keep our mental state high, if we are positive and possess a strong willpower, if we have a strong faith in ourselves and in the divine, then which ghost can bother us? It is a case of like attracts like, just as water seeks its own level. Troubled ghostly souls hover around their own kind and don't have the courage to come in the vicinity of a strong mind. The contrast between their troubled situation and a strong and peaceful one is too jarring for them. Now one thing to note here is that our mental state cannot switch from being fearful and superstitious to being brave and courageous overnight. For this we have to practice and build up our mental stamina just as we build up our physical stamina with regular exercise. Now one way to keep our mind in a high zone is to regularly read spiritual literature, especially the courage giving and soul lifting works of great Vedantic Gurus such as Swami Vivekanand, Swami Abhedanand, Sri Ram Sharma Achar, Swami Sivananda, Sri Aurobindo and the Mother. Another way as Sri Ram Sharma Achar has recommended is to always keep the atmosphere in our house holy by playing bhajans and other devotional songs holding group prayer sessions and group chanting of mantras such as the Gayatri Mant, singing hymns to the accompaniment of musical instruments, sounding shanks and performing rituals such as yagyas. Whichever one of these one can manage easily and regularly. Now here I have mentioned rituals belonging to the Hindu faith, but whichever religion you belong to, you can take the rituals from that faith and substitute. In this way, we can uplift not only our own mental state and deepen our faith in divine protection, but also keep all low energy and negative entities at bay. Now if you happen to be the person who sent me this question about the house near the graveyard and after hearing all this you still have some lingering doubts because you may have heard that such a house is not Vastu or Feng Shui compliant and will bring you bad luck, then I would like to narrate for you a story from the life of Swami Vivekanan that will clear your doubts. After the death of their Guru Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda and other disciples looked for a place where they could establish a mutt and live together as sannyasins. However, being terribly short of money, they could find nothing suitable. The only house that the disciples could afford to rent was an old dilapidated building which had the reputation for being haunted by evil spirits. Here is a picture of that building. This house Swami Vivekananda promptly agreed to rent and it became the first mutt that he established and is known as the Baranagor mutt. Now the interesting fact to note about this story is that when choosing to live in this dilapidated and haunted building, Swami Vivekanand did not consult Vastu or Feng Shui. He simply went for the most practical and feasible solution as many times we ourselves have to do in life. Not once did Swami Vivekanand or his brother disciples bother their heads with whether the energy of the place was right or if ghosts would possess them or if spirits would do them harm. In fact, Swami Vivekanand once jokingly remarked, I am a sort of demon myself and have not much fear of ghosts. And so Swamiji and his brother disciples lived in that house confidently and peacefully, secure in the knowledge that the real power lay within them, in their Atma, their soul and not with entities outside. What's more, no ill luck befell them either. 
because later on, as we know, Swami Vivekananda went on to achieve worldwide fame. Now here I'm not saying that Vastu and Feng Shui are wrong. There is certainly some truth in them. But whenever we focus on these things excessively, we tend to become so reliant on them that eventually we put aside all common sense and practicality and turn into fearful, superstitious and weak beings. We start to feel that the shape of our room or the location of our house or if we don't put crystals in this or that corner, all these things will bring us ill luck and affect our destiny. We ascribe more power to crystals and things outside and less to the all-powerful Atma that dwells inside. Our attitude, as Swami Vivekananda has taught, should be the exact opposite. Our attitude should be, My Atma is so great that before my will, mountains will crumble up and oceans will dry. What to speak of some silly ghost? This is the sort of attitude, energy and willpower we must all strive to possess. Question number 4. People who commit suicide, are they always around the people because of whom they took their lives? Do they cause problems for them? Are they always falling like a shadow? Well, those who commit suicide may or may not be around, but as we have discussed, if our Atma is strong, if it is free from the guilt of being the cause for someone else's decision to commit suicide, then no harm can come to us. If on the other hand, our behavior contributed to someone taking their life, then more than the ghost doing harm, we should be worried about karmic consequences which are extremely grave. If we do not atone for such a sin through repentance, charitable actions or even jail time if necessary, then the sufferings one will have to undergo in the afterlife are absolutely horrific and will far surpass any suffering one can experience in their earthly life. Question number 5 I want to donate my body for medical research. So in this case, my body will not get cremated. So does this mean that I will become a ghost after death? This question is referring to an earlier video where I discussed why the Vedic Rishis preferred cremating dead bodies over burying them. And one of the reasons was that the Rishis were concerned that burials would negatively impact the condition of certain souls in the afterlife, especially those who had nurtured a deep attachment with their body and earthly life. Such souls after death, when they see their body decaying in the grave, become greatly distressed and don't want to let go of it and thus they get stuck unable to transition on to restful and peaceful conditions in the afterlife. They become ghosts who hover and wail around their graves. Now here it is very important to make the distinction that everyone buried does not become a ghost after death, but only those few who cherished excessive worldly attachments. Most others can and do move on after death. So if you are the person who has made this noble decision to donate your body for medical research, then even though your body will not be cremated, still the ghost state will certainly not be your fate after death. The very fact that you have pledged your body for medical research indicates that you are already in possession of a sufficiently detached attitude. Contrast this with the mental state of an attached person who identifies so deeply with his or her body that he or she cannot even bear the idea of their body being cremated, let alone allowing it to be mutilated for medical research or organ donation purposes. In fact, the attitude and perspective with which we live life also carries over to the afterlife, since our mind journeys with our soul after death. So if you are happy donating your body before death, then you shall certainly be very happy to see it utilized for a good cause after death. This act will be a source of great peace and contentment for you in the afterlife and will certainly not generate any mental distress or feelings of attachment. Question number 6 my mother was unhappy before she passed three years ago. She comes in my sister's dreams quite often. Mostly the dreams are pleasant, still I'm worried that this might mean that she's stuck in the ghost state and has not moved on after death. Now in order to answer this question properly, we must first understand the difference between those that get trapped in the ghostly state after death and those who are able to move on. Now when I say move on, I don't mean that the departed travel to some faraway location in the universe. Instead, what I am really referring to is their mental condition after death. Have they been able to let go of their past attachments and transition forward? That is the question. So in the case of ghosts, these are people who for a variety of reasons which we have discussed in the previous video, get stuck in an agitated, distressed and unhappy state of mind after death. There is a saying in India that the feet of a ghost always point backwards. And it is really apt because the attention of these distressed spirits is so firmly fixed on the life they just left behind 
that the entire train of their spiritual evolution comes to a halt and they are unable to progress and develop any further. The majority of people however do not fall into this ghostly state after death because they are able to come to terms with their past, accept their new existence and move on to a state of peace and rest. Such people are called Pithars in Sanskrit and although this word translates into fathers or ancestors, it basically stands for any friend or relative who is deceased such as parents, grandparents, children, aunts, uncles etc. Now these Pithars, even though they are in a state of peace and rest after death, still they retain feelings and affections for the loved ones they left behind. And so occasionally some of these Pithars do reach out to their dear ones on earth for various purposes. Sometimes they wish to transmit messages of well-being, to let their relatives know that they are okay on the other side. Sometimes it is to reassure a child or spouse who is missing them dearly. Other times they may intervene to assist a loved one passing through difficult times. All these instances of Pithars reaching out to relatives have been well documented in many books such as Invisible Helpers by C. W. Leadbeater, the books by psychic John Edward and the Hindi book Pithar Hamare Adrishya Sahayak by Sri Ram Sharma Acharya. Now the manner in which these Pithars reach out to relatives on earth varies greatly depending upon the abilities, spiritual stature and willpower of the Pithars. However, the most common methods employed are through dreams and thoughts. As we have seen in an earlier video, the mind accompanies the soul after death. And so after death, the departed spirits live in a mental world. Therefore, even though we may feel the physical absence of a deceased relative very acutely, and we may imagine that they are physically very far away from us, in reality they are extremely close to us. They are just a thought away as all minds are connected. Now the process by which such mental communications happen has been explained by the mother who was a great God realized yogi and the spiritual counterpart of Sri Aurobindo. When one thinks of somebody quite powerfully, there is a small emanation of mental substance, a vibration of your thought which goes out and touches this person. And if he is receptive, he sees you. He sees you and tells you, you came last night to see me. That's because you made a small formation and this formation went and did its work, which was to put you in contact with this person or else carry a message if you had something special to tell him. This kind of telepathic communication happens quite spontaneously between the living and the dead, between two human beings themselves and even between humans and animals. Rupert Sheldrake, a British scientist, has done great work investigating the last two types of telepathic communications. So to answer this question, the fact that one sees their deceased mother or some other relative in their dreams does not imply that this family member is stuck in the ghost state after death. Even though the deceased relative may have been unhappy about certain things while living, still it does not mean that this is necessarily their state after death. After death, they may have evaluated and understood their problems in a better light and so it is quite likely that they are in a peaceful state right now. And this is probably what this reader's mother is trying to communicate to his sister. Now one point I would like to stress here is that when interpreting dreams, one must be exceedingly rational and logical, otherwise we place ourselves in the dangerous position of toppling into a bottomless well of superstition, over analysis of dreams and enhancement of one's ego as we begin to attach unnecessary and false pride to our own psychic abilities. In particular, we must not make the mistake of interpreting every dream as a message from a deceased relative. Many times we may be thinking of someone during the day and we may dream of this very person at night. Other times our subconscious through dreams may be trying to work out issues we might have suppressed. So it is very important to be able to separate telepathic dreams from normal ones. Some distinguishing marks of telepathic dreams are that they are infrequent, they occur out of the blue even when we have not been thinking of that person and the message that they convey is sufficiently deep so that the dream leaves a lasting impression on our mind. Question number 7 My mother-in-law died last month. How long after death can I contact her? Is it days or months? Or is it best to do nothing and let her go in her own way of evolution? The best and most optimal course of action that the great gurus of Vedanta recommend is actually to not try and contact the departed. The reason for this is a very sound one and I shall explain it from the combined writings of Sri Ram Sharma Achar and Swami Sivananda. 
See what usually happens for most people and here I stress the word most as this is not a hard and fast rule that always applies to everyone who has died. So in the case of most people, sometime after death they fall into a state of sleep and rest. Hence the prayers for the departed to rest in peace. This fact has been detailed by Sri Ram Sharma Achar in his book. Just as we fall asleep after a long and tiring day of work, similarly the departed spirits need this rejuvenating rest after a lifetime of activity. The duration of this sleep is not fixed but varies from person to person depending upon their individual needs. When the deceased wake up from the sleep, they are fully rejuvenated and are in a sound position to evaluate their past life, work out certain karmas in the subtle realms, enjoy the fruits of good deeds and atone for wrongs committed. This period corresponds to the experiences of heaven and hell described in many religions. Here we must note that heaven and hell are not places but mental experiences which differ for each individual. After the lessons are learned from this period, the soul looks for opportunities to take a new birth. Now as Swami Sivananda has explained in his book, if in the midst of this process we try and communicate with the departed, then we significantly interrupt their march forward. In trying to get them to answer our curiosity queries or in clinging to them so that we can derive comfort for our distraught mental state or in asking them to help solve our earthly problems, we are only pulling them towards our earth consciousness and binding them to us. Because of this downward pull, the deceased spirits take longer to fall asleep and even when they manage to fall asleep, their rest is a disturbed one. What's more, after waking up, our constant overtures don't allow them to properly settle into peaceful conditions of the subtle realms, nor can they properly learn the lessons their soul needs to evolve higher. Our numerous disturbances can even cause them to miss a suitable opportunity for rebirth. So it is best to avoid disturbing the deceased spirits with constant queries. However, if for the sake of emotional closure, we feel the need to know of our loved one's well-being on the other side, then we can certainly pose such a one-off question to them in our mind. In our thoughts, we can ask them for a sign and leave it at that. They will find a way to let us know if they're okay. But it is best not to pursue even such queries too much, nor must we try to contact them through a medium or seance or some planchet kind of thing, as all these things will disturb their peace greatly. Question number 8. What is the best thing to do for a person who has died? The best thing to do for a departed soul is to pray for them. This is especially important in the period immediately after death. As Swami Sivananda has explained, after death the disembodied spirits remain earthbound for some time. This is because the memories and attachments of the life just left behind are still fresh in their minds. So when family members sincerely pray for their rest and well-being, it provides the deceased with strong mental and emotional support and they can easily release themselves from their earth-centric preoccupations and worries and transition to a state of rest. On the other hand, if they see their family members collapsing under the weight of grief, then it pains them deeply and they feel utterly helpless to do anything and on account of this worried mental state, they find it difficult to fall into a restful sleep. So it is very important that those left behind be brave and courageous in the event of a loved one's passing. What's more, even as the years go by, we should not forget those who have departed but we must keep them in our thoughts and prayers. And when thinking about the deceased, we should focus on their positive qualities, recall the good times we spent together and not dwell on any mistakes made or hurt caused. Question number 9. Someone in my family passed away in tragic circumstances. I am afraid that they may have gotten trapped in the ghost state. What can I do to help this person? There are two things to do in this situation. The first as we have just discussed is to pray for the well-being of the deceased in a calm manner without feeling distraught and keeping our thoughts full of love and affection for the deceased. Such prayers should preferably be done in a group setting as the collective will of many people can act as a strong force to bring peace and emotional support to the mind of one who has passed tragically. Moreover, these prayer sessions should be held for at least 7 days after passing. This holds true for both normal and tragic deaths. The second thing to do is to pray directly to any god, saint or guru that one has faith in. 
One of the works that all genuine divine personalities undertake is to provide help and support to the departed in the afterlife. So calling upon such personalities with faith and sincerity is extremely important and they will certainly come and assist your loved one who has crossed over to the other side. The mother herself has spoken about it and so has Sri Ram Sharma Achar. In fact, the mother has said that one of her missions was to create a passage through the world after death so that anyone with the smallest iota of faith in the divine can have a safe and protected journey. Similarly, Sri Ram Sharma Achar has also stated that he personally comes and receives those who entrusted their spiritual development in his care at the time of death. Now we must remember that even though the mother and Sri Ram Sharma Achar have both given up their physical sheets, they still maintain a presence in the subtle and causal realms and assist faithfuls from there. This same fact holds true for many other great Indian gurus, prophets and saints belonging to other religions. Question number 10. What should I do if I ever see a ghost? Before I proceed to answer this last question, we must bear in mind that the chances that any one of us will ever encounter a ghost in our lifetime are actually very slim. This is because, as we have discussed earlier, ghosts are few in number to begin with. Secondly, troubled ghostly souls like to hang around their own kind and don't have the courage to come in the vicinity of a strong mind. And lastly, even if some ghost is hovering around us, the probability that we will actually see them is quite low as the vast majority of ghostly souls don't have the ability to materialize before us in a physical form. In fact, the only time troubled ghostly souls muster up the courage to appear before a strong mind is when they are desperately searching for help to release themselves from their troubled condition. To fulfill this aim, these ghostly souls appear before relatives or spiritually oriented persons or before great yogis. Cases of such appearances before yogis have been well documented in the lives of Swami Vivekanand, Swami Brahmanand and Swami Abhedanand. The strong willpower of these yogis is what these ghosts need to switch their troubled minds back into a restful state. So in the rare event that we do find ourselves face to face with the ghost, here's what we should do as explained by the mother. When people who have left their body appear in front of you, you must not fear. It is generally because they are restless and lack peace. Give them a good thought and wish them to be in peace and it will be over. In any case, you can tell them to go to mother and they will not bother you anymore. Remember that it is only fear which hurts and not the spirits. Of course, here it goes without saying that one can redirect such a distressed spirit to not just mother but any divine personality whom we have faith in. Now, if you enjoyed watching this video and would like to learn more about God, soul, consciousness, life and death, then do subscribe if you've not already done so. The reason I'm asking you to subscribe is because I only manage to make about one video a month, sometimes not even that. This is because making this kind of content is a very time and research intensive work. So do come aboard the Spiritual Bee family by subscribing and join me as I make a journey across the timeless ocean of Vedantic spirituality, visiting many great topics in the future such as Karma, Samadhi, Kundalini, Awakening, etc. Thanks for watching and I shall see you in the next video.